This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pauline Shukmak, Jr., host for We Like the 1%. We Like the 1% is about individuals and entrepreneurs, and where most people fear to tread, entrepreneurs only see vast opportunities. This is especially the case with the coming robot revolution. Today, we'll be discussing the pros and cons associated with the fast approaching rise of the machines. My guest today is Michael Collat, Senior Associate at Booz Allen Hamilton and Regional Director of First Robotics. Aloha and good morning, Michael. Well, aloha, Pauline. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's my pleasure. This is one of my favorite subjects, yeah. so I'm glad you're uh, able yeah. to be with us here this morning. Now, speaking of first robots and first robotics, uh, last year, in uh, 2017, 500 years ago in 1517 hmm. was the 500th anniversary of the first ever actual robot. And hmm. this was an invention, a creation by Leonardo da Vinci. And this is the mechanical lion he yeah. had created as a present, as mm -hmm. a gift to Francis I. So we've come a long way since then, There's sort of a silent period in those 500 mm -hmm. years from da Vinci to now. But um, this is something exciting. It's something a lot of people are talking about because many people fear the coming of the robots. Uh, they fear for their jobs. But then on the bright side, mm -hmm. uh, it creates more jobs. So there's going to be more demand for different skills, and those people can learn new skills and upgrade their skills. And so it's that not that much of a threat, really. So we're going to discuss this back and forth, this sort of Andy Puzzler versus Elon Musk debate. <laughs> so, um, but before we get into the nitty gritty of that kind of uh, debate, uh, could you please tell us a little bit about the consultancy firm Booz Allen Hamilton? Certainly. Well, I'm privileged to work for Booz Allen is a consulting firm of over about 25,000 people worldwide. It's a global firm. It's been a presence in Hawaii actually for over 20 years. So that's been uh, helping clients uh, solve some of their toughest problems uh, locally, uh, regionally, and globally for, for a long time. Booz Allen actually is over 100 years old and, and invented the management consulting business. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, and so you know, now as we're in our second century, we are taking that legacy and building on it by adding additional capabilities and technological innovations along the lines of uh, cyber and digital analytics, digital solutions, and systems engineering to take some of those solutions and and help our clients solve their problems. Because at, at the end of the day, we are more in just in the business of pointing out what you know where the dysfunction is in the clients. It mm -hmm. doesn't help to be a consulting firm that comes in and tells people what they're doing wrong, mm -hmm. but to actually help them solve their problem and bring them those solutions. And your role there, your title is senior associate. <coughs> so what does your job primarily entail at Booz Allen Hamilton? So my area of focus is I actually run the Air Force account in the Pacific. So we have contracts and staff from Alaska, Hawaii, Korea, and Japan across the Pacific Rim. And is it my understanding that primarily most of the employees at Booz Allen Hamilton are current military and ex-military? Is that the main composition of the firm? There are a variety uh, of, of skill sets and we bring a lot of diversity to that. Certainly uh, a large number of our clients are federal government and specifically the Department of Defense. So having folks with a background that understand those clients uh, is very important, but we layer that with a lot of functional capabilities along the lines that I just mentioned, cyber, uh, data analytics, and so on. So we try and layer that in our, through our collaborative culture, mm -hmm. you know, take that knowledge of the clients and, and the functional expertise and layer that together for those kinds of solutions. And what percentage, what amount of the consultancy work out of Booz Allen Hamilton is related to robotics? Uh, I don't know of a particular um, uh, uh, percentage of that, but that certainly I think the uh, there's it's very technical in nature a lot of times, and, and robotics uh, I think uh, spans the it, robotics itself spans the technological spectrum from from the kinetic things to but the, the, there's the programming and the analytics and the sensing and the algorithms and and all those things. So I think that uh, I think a lot of what Booz Allen does is directly applicable um, to uh, the field of robotics. Uh, there, in, in particular, I know that, that we've done some work through the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agencies, mm -hmm. DARPA, mm -hmm. uh, working with particularly with robotics and prosthetics and so on and we've taken some of that work uh, which has been very helpful with uh, applying to the military in the world of force protection mm -hmm. 
and then uh, applying that through our community foundation to actually work and help improve uh, folks and bring those similar solutions to other applications such as uh, folks that, are, that uh, suffer from ALS or other things that, that, that uh, need the help of those prosthetics. Oh, that's wonderful yeah. work. And now, Booz Allen Hamilton is a strategic partner with First Robotics, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, so correct. you have this yeah. competition that you're yes. primarily involved in, and yeah. that's with uh, what grade of children does that? Yeah, so the, so the First Robotics competition is actually the high school level. Mm -hmm. It's There's a family of programs across First Robotics that starts with uh, actually preschool or and kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. And uh, so Booz Allen, because we recognize that that's a, a very valuable um, uh, thing to, for the community and for, the, for our, our, so our grow, developing our future workforce as well too, to have this, these, uh, cultivate these uh, next generation of innovators and problem solvers. Uh, so we're heavily invested in, uh, in, Booz, in uh, FIRST Robotics. And so yes, that's the sort of an intersection of my two interests, which, are, which overlap actually, again, because of Booz, Booz Allen as well too. So, so I, here in Hawaii, I serve as the regional director at, for the, the uh, high school level program for FIRST Robotics. And we help to host the, the big competition that's uh, starting here in, uh, in, in March. The season just kicked off, mm -hmm. okay. so they had yeah. a big, big kickoff in January when the game is revealed. The, it's, it's really remarkable because the kids don't even know what the, the rules of the game are. They change every year. I was just about to ask yes, you about that. Exactly. Because is it necessarily a physical looking robot? Is it a robotic car? Is it an autonomy? So you pick a different kind of robotic entity. I, exactly. They have a yeah. lot of similar design elements to them, mm -hmm. but the challenge is different every year. So therefore, the design has to be different every year. They can't use last year's robot uh, to mm -hmm. do yeah. the same thing. They're, they're, they're rather specialized. So the game and the way you get your points and the challenges that have to be uh, accomplished changes every year. So they get revealed globally uh, on January 4th this year all at the same time and then they, the, the kids have six weeks to strategize, to design, to build, to test, mm -hmm. to rebuild because they're probably going to fail the first few yes. times, right? Yeah. And, and go through a whole cycle and then they have to stop building six weeks and then the competition season starts. So it's a global competition and it how is. many countries participate in this? So one? there's actually over, uh, first is in over 85 countries. There's mm -hmm. about, a, a, actually, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, it's a pretty big program. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very and large. How many years has this been? competition been occurring? Well, in Hawaii, this is the 11th year. Oh, okay. So, first has been going on for a number of years, but uh, but it came to Hawaii about uh, 11 years ago, so we're very proud that this is the this is the 11th year for this particular competition. And this ha will happen at the UH Stan Sheriff Center here at, uh, towards the end of March. And who are the judges? Who, who decides who made the best robot? Uh, so, the, the comp there's, there's a number of uh, there's awards that are, the judges do for very, and there's all kinds of, uh, of, of awards for you know, the best design, the most innovation. There's a whole number of flavor of awards. The competition itself, it, it plays out like a game and is a sport. So there, there's uh, points are scored, and it, they have a whole round of playoffs and, 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 and or a round of competitions and games that then lead into a playoff situation. So the second day of the afternoon is all the playoffs. So there is eventually a, an actual winner crowned like, like a Super Bowl through, uh, through a series of head-to-head -head competitions. And what's the prize? Is there a prize? Uh, well, sort of, yeah. One of, the, one of the big prizes that comes out of this regional competition is the ability to go to the national competition and compete uh, with uh, all the international teams. Oh, and the, the ultimate yeah. prize among the international? Yeah. The ultimate prize, I think, is a, is a lot of bragging rights and a, and a <laughs> lot of pride. <laughs> a lot of pride, yes, exactly. No free so. robo-made or anything like uh, that? <laughs> no, I don't think that they, they uh, no, no, none of that. <laughs> we're, not, we're not at that point yet. Not okay. yet, a not free, yet. A free robotic car, an exactly, autonomous yeah, vehicle. Yeah, maybe we get the sponsored like the NFL is, and maybe at some point yeah, you'll have you'll have all kinds of prizes. And so, so for all the uh, high school students yes. that are watching, uh, how can they uh, maybe participate or get their school to participate in this competition if they haven't yeah. already done so. Is there a website people can go to? Certainly, for first certainly. So yeah. first, uh, the website is firstinspires.org, mm -hmm. and uh, there's lots of uh, links into that. You drill down into that, and, and there's ways to link in and, and say, I'm, I'm interested in starting a team or interested in finding a team, and the, the website will link you up. Do you know approximately how many high school students ha from Hawaii have participated thus far in the past 11 years? Uh, well, there's thousands, yeah, thousands, thousands of yeah, thousands of students, yeah. yeah there, there's there's uh, about 28 teams all together for this particular competition uh, and, this, and this league across the state of Hawaii. And the but there's, this is one of many programs. There's you know, Again, FIRST, FIRST has many flavors, and mm -hmm. then there's, besides FIRST, there's other robotics programs. So but, uh, surprisingly, um, it might be counterintuitive is that, that Hawaii is actually has one of the highest uh, penetration rates of, of robotics programs for schools yes. yeah. in the thing, so yeah. uh, in in the country. So uh, you know, it's, it's actually leading uh, leading forward, despite uh, you know what some mm -hmm. some people have for 
for reputation of those schools are, are leaning, leaning forward and are, are a world leader. And is the primary objective of the creation of this competition to get younger people, the next generation, involved in robotics-related occupations so they don't get mm -hmm. left behind? Because one of the concerns mm -hmm. of the vast majority of the population is that at first it was 60 percent, but now it's yeah. more like the real reality is going to be 70 to 90 percent of jobs are going to be overtaken by robots. Mm -hmm. And robots, it doesn't necessarily mean a human figure, a, a humanoid figure. Right. Uh, the first one is going to be the run of autonomous vehicles that are going to be deployed right. by 2020. So this will put a lot of truck drivers out of business, cab drivers, any any Uber driver, Lyft driver, that, right. they're, the autonomous vehicles are coming. And an autonomous vehicle is effectively a robotic car. So those are the first strain of robots. So is it, is it mainly, uh, I don't know the themes of the past 11 competitions, yeah. but are, have they been focused largely on a vehicle type entity, uh, that kind of a robot? So, so yes, yeah. so the, the robots themselves are on a chassis with wheels and they move around a playing field and they will either try to uh, throw a ball into a, an object or through a hoop or in one, one year it was tossing a frisbee, mm. which is a little different. So there's a variety of challenges that that's are out there. That's your favorite one, isn't it? That's probably one, that's probably one of my favorite ones. That was uh, that, because they were flying everywhere and the action was crazy that year. So, and uh, among the high, I'm just curious, yeah. among the high school students, is it uh, roughly a mix of male and female, or is it more the boys, or does it matter? Or is there a certain, does it have to be, you have to have a certain mix on the team? Or? Uh, th there's not a requirement for okay. a mix, but there are yeah. there are a mix of teams, and there's teams such, such as Sacred Hearts, which is all female team. And yes. so there's, there, there's great representation across that, and it's really wonderful to see. You know, across across both public and private schools, and across genders, and, and it's uh, it's really wonderful to see. And and I think one of the one of the really fun parts about it is to see the cooperation that happens across teams. Uh, in fact, they they they, they coin a phrase there called a cooperation. Yes. So it's, it's both competition, <laughs> but there's also a lot of cooperation. There's an opportunity to practice one of the first uh, main values, which is gracious professionalism. Yes. And so that they all they can <laughs> while, while they are exactly while they are competing, <laughs> they also have an obligation to help each other out and to share. And so you'll see a lot of teams say, oh, I, I need this tool and make an announcement and someone from another team will run over and hand them and lend them their tool. It's like the that. pit stop in the Grand Prix. It's you exactly, and, and, that, and that's, yeah. that's exactly what they call the area where they work on the their robot stop. is called the pits. No. Yes, okay. Exactly. That's <laughs> Sounds exactly like that's like right. a derogatory connotation. Yeah. <laughs> so the pits, the pits. It's, the, it's the pits in, ter in terms of like the, uh, the, the, the pit, pit, for the pit yeah. spot for the, uh, for the cars. Exactly. And is your perception upon watching or observing these competitions, is that, is it the case that older generations of individuals are more frightened because it's a major change, whereas the younger, the next generation, is more excited yeah. about robots. They're not; they're less yeah. frightened of them. Do you see any fear among younger people? I, no, I don't. I yeah. don't, don't see the fear. Because I, they're I think used to it. I do. I yeah. think that's true probably of just about everything. I think yeah. in, in general, uh, you know, younger people uh, embrace change because everything is new to them, right? Yeah. It's, uh, I think we become ingrained and set in our ways as the years go on. So I think in general, that's a fair assessment. Is that this is exactly yeah. what yeah. my first guest yeah. uh, mentioned, Euron, when we had him on the show via Skype? Uh, it, you know, when the sewing machine was invented, everybody screamed and said, "Oh my gosh, exactly. they're going to take over our job! The machines are going to take exactly. over our job! They just created a whole new industry, and it made things move more efficiently. Uh, it created new, brand new jobs. More people could become fashion." designers so it opened up a whole new area exactly. so in your opinion where do you think this fear comes from is it just change or is it the fact is it this kind of mental laziness that oh my gosh now I have to learn a new skill so I can get a different job later on when this becomes a reality so or is it a combination of I, both I, factors? I would guess I, I would hazard a guess that it would probably be the former I think it's just fear of change in general which is a, a innate human reaction to things right and I think some people love change I, I, I like new things so, exactly, uh, yeah, exactly. So. I think I think that's uh, mm -hmm. that's something that has to be overcome though and learned I think it's almost learned behavior to some degree yeah right so yeah. Uh, I think that though uh, it, the second part where you think where you have to where they're intellectualizing the need to change a job and trying to understand the ramifications of it, mm -hmm. I think I think that's probably less likely because I think if they were to in intellectualize it to come to that conclusion, they would probably be coming to a different conclusion if they put that much thought into it. Okay, right, you know, <laughs> that's, that's just my sense. I'm just I'm you know I don't know for sure, but that's what that would be my uh, my sense of things. Okay, very yeah. good. So we're going to yeah. get over the fear now, and we're just going to take a break, and we'll come back with fear. the positives about robotics. Then. Fear not, we will be back. <laughs> Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on ThinkTech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come 
to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch. And every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha everyone, welcome back. We're here with Michael Collat talking about robots. So Michael, now we're going to get into the pros and cons of robotics. Uh, now, there is a businessman, a gentleman named Andrew Puzder, mm -hmm. and he's well known for his comments about how he, much he loves a robotic workforce. I, mm -hmm. I personally can't wait for the robotic workforce to be deployed, uh, probably realistically in about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the comments he made is that robots are always polite, they never get sick, uh, and for anybody who's run a business or have been in charge uh, managing employees, there are bad employees. Uh, there are a lot of good employees out there, but the bad ones really cause problems for an yeah. organization. And it's very difficult to fire people, especially nowadays with all the regulations. And then you have these unions and things like that. So I'm actually really grateful the robots are coming <clears throat> because it makes an entrepreneur's life a lot easier. There are less mistakes one has to deal with. Um, as Puzder said, they don't, take, they don't need holidays. Right. They never get sick. They do break down. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. going to have a job right. created where a robot repairman will have to exist. But then again, uh, maybe there is this kind of um, a replicant robot that will repair the other robots. So maybe you don't even need that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, it, it, the problems fix themselves. So um, what is your, uh, are, uh, what are some of the benefits of having robots in a workforce, you think, in 10 years? So we can get mm. over this fear factor first. And then I'll bring the fear back to everybody later when we talk sure. about Musk's comments. Yeah. Sure. Well, I think that uh, I think you've hit upon some of them already, and, and that is the fact that, yeah, some things will change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've heard it said that um, robots will, they may not take your job, but they will definitely change your job. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen that already, and we, that's true of robots as it is of any other technology. I'm sure there were people uh, who were uh, maybe perhaps porters uh, many, many years ago when the wheel was invented. They said, now, I don't, now there will not be a need for me to carry things. Mm -hmm. I'll be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Right. But, but I think that uh, for the most part, I think that uh, there are so many uh, things, and we've already seen it, right? And, you, and whether you're doing work on a word processor, I'm sure everybody does that. And, and if anybody's old enough to have worked on a typewriter mm. and now has a word processor, they appreciate how much better their, their quality of work life is now because of that. It makes everything right. run more efficiently. It can. Right. It can, yeah. yes. Okay, so people every, will every have change, more free time. Exactly, yes. and we'll, but it'll introduce complexities and it'll introduce challenges as well, too. So now when your computer breaks, now you're actually completely out of luck a lot of times, whereas before, not so much. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, good, there's up, up and a downside to everything. Now, most of the robotic jobs, this 70 to 90 percent, is sort of a manual labor that humans have had to right. troll through for centuries. And I'm just curious what you think would happen to unions, because a lot of unions are based on that manual labor that mm -hmm. has something to do with physical labor. So would it kind of do away with uh, unions and things like that? Oh, that that's a really interesting mm -hmm. notion. I think, uh, I think it will depend upon how people adapt. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I see the need of uh, you know, unions playing a role in serving as not just as a way of of linking manual labor people together, but as a way of helping as a balance of power between labor and management, right? That's really where they came about. And I think that that need will still exist. Mm -hmm. So whether it exists in its current construct centered around manual labor uh, uh, practitioners or whether it involves into something different, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's what we'll see. I'm going to have a couple of guests from Oceanit next month mm. uh, yeah. to discuss coding. 
And one of the gentlemen who will be my guest uh, mentioned that coding is going to be the blue collar job of the future. So every you'll probably still it already have is, union. Though, to a large it already degree. is. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So uh, you know the unions will just change shape themselves. Yes. Maybe uh, I don't know how easy it is to strike. Then if the, if the train can drive itself, then you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about all that. So. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, Michael, what kind of jobs uh, for people who want to who feel that they need to upgrade their skills to prepare themselves for this in about a decade? What kind of jobs will be the most prominent uh, in terms of training oneself in the robotics field? What kind of jobs will be available out there for people to get into and they should start training from now? Well, I think probably the most important skill to prepare for the future is the ability to, to cultivate critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's foundational to everything and that's the foundation for adaptability. So as we've seen, jobs that require uh, rote um, recitation or rote uh, execution of a particular set of, of physical actions, those, those are ripe for outsourcing and those are ripe for, for automation. And those are the kind of things that, uh, that training in that kind of thing is probably not the best investment. The ability to then adapt and apply things in new ways, uh, that's what humans are good at, that's what robots are bad at. Mm -hmm. So the ability to do that and the ability to understand and leverage technology in new and different ways is probably, I think, the best thing you can do to prepare for the future economy. Now, let's go back uh, to the dark side. The dark side. <laughs> now, uh, as a counter to Puzzler's co optimistic comments about the robotic workforce mm -hmm. being deployed, uh, there are some consequences we should think about. So Elon Musk was one of the main individuals to bring mm -hmm. this argument up in the sense that uh, we won't really think about the consequences of robots walking around until a robot kills two humans in the street. So uh, what do you think are the downsides to this robot, this um, ubiquitous robotic workforce walking amongst humans? Yeah. <laughs> well, whether or not, as you say, walking, you know, you, you alluded to it before, is that it's not just mm -hmm. a kinetic, it's not just a physical presence of robots. You know, there is the, uh, any kind of form of artificial intelligence or um, automation that happens behind the scenes mm -hmm. is, is also a form of robotics, right? And, and we're already seeing that today. Yes, right, one of the so. dangerous things, as I mentioned, the first kind of robotic entity is right. the autonomous vehicle. And I, I saw this beautiful presentation by Kaspersky Labs. Uh, this is mm -hmm. one of the top cybersecurity companies. And they it was a lovely presentation, this slideshow that this uh, Russian gentleman was showing to us. Mm -hmm. And it was about the attack points on an autonomous vehicle, how an autonomous vehicle, because it runs on sensors mm -hmm. and the cloud and all this sort of thing, yes. how it can be attacked in, at 25 different points. And they've already done the crash tests, what would happen mm -hmm. if a hacker were to intrude upon the system of an autonomous vehicle and somebody's riding in it. Yeah. And it's pretty gruesome, actually. So yeah. <laughs> we're just going to bring all the fear back to you. Now. Yeah. We're going to come full circle. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it's quite scary in that respect, sure. because eventually there are going to be driverless cars everywhere. You don't need to worry about parking, but you might have to get worried about being hacked and crashing into a wall by whoever's hacking the vehicle. So it could be a source of kind of different kind of terrorism. Certainly. And I think that you've highlighted that point. I think you mentioned it before, too, is that every opportunity then also creates vulnerability, right? So you have to be on guard for that. And you have to think about, and, and that's part of thinking ahead in rolling out the technology is considering these kinds of things and, and developing safeguards for that. I think that's probably, though, uh, not always been the strong suit, right? As a society, there's a rush to get things out there. And certainly, businesses are incentivized to get things out there and, and uh, generating revenue quickly and we'll worry about the downsides later. And so I think maybe to Elon Musk's point, maybe that's what it takes, whether it's a, a version of, uh, you know, for instance, a Pearl Harbor, for instance. Mm. Uh, it's always used as, as a, the digital Pearl Harbor is used yes. as a, the example in, in the, the cyber world, as we already are connected and this, this uber connected world we're in and so reliant on power grids and other things and that, that uh, many people have said it will take a digital Pearl Harbor before mm. we are, as a nation, are alert to the uh, and, and motivated to respond to the vulnerabilities that we have uh, introduced by uh, by our over connect well, not over but our our uber connectedness uber connectedness yeah, exactly yeah, that's a good lovely yeah. word yeah. Uh, now uh, just on on just to end on the bright side on this yeah. uh, topic uh, a lot of great innovation came from a dark place originally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe Google started off by people wanting to exchange pornographic images over the internet. Mm -hmm. And then it's turned into this vast library that everybody can mm -hmm. use, they can educate themselves. Now MIT and Harvard have free courses you can take yeah. online. So it 
they, a lot of these things come from a dark place, but okay. then they become great. And then they could be abused, yeah. but the abuse is probably less than 1% of the population will know how to do it in the first place yeah. and then actually go through with it. Uh, so uh, also cryptocurrencies, you know, this kind of uh, this Bitcoin, mm -hmm. a lot of these things like Silk Road, they were dark entities, exactly. but then it can be used for other purposes. So um, it, discussing this balance, are you more optimistic about the good benefits that come from the robotic revolution, or are you more on the downside yourself, personally? Personally, I, I'm optimistic. Okay, yeah, me too. I, 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 I think that, uh, as we've seen throughout the march of history, is that technology has, has improved our standard of living and our quality of life as, as, a, as a society and uh, as human beings. So it's, certainly there's downsides. Certainly the technology gets employed for, for bad purposes, you know, uh, I think, but, but overall, I think the trend is pretty, um, uh, pretty unmistakable, and that our quality and our standard of living has improved uh, just stead steadily. Yeah. yeah. Now, now one of the unfortunate things is, is that yes, most people can help themselves. They pick themselves up and they deal mm -hmm. with the change. A lot of people maybe can't at the equal pace mm -hmm. of the average person. So, one of my concerns is uh, in ten years' time, you know. Every decade or two, there's always a fashionable disease. You know, mm -hmm. uh, at one point it was AIDS. Now it's sort of a cancer. Uh, in 10 years, it's predicted by a lot of people in the health professions that depression is actually going to overtake cancer because there, is, there are going to be a lot of developments in cancer research mm -hmm. that will either cure cancers or prevent them at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. So that's going to no longer be so much of a problem, but they said depression is, and I'm just wondering if one of the reasons for that is that because people's jobs will be taken away from them, and this is more the case for people who can't keep up, who can't upgrade their skill, will those people fall into depression? I'm wondering if those are the ones susceptible to depression, and if there's some interconnectedness with the mm -hmm. robot revolution, <laughs> in your opinion. Well, that's an interesting and co yeah. compelling thought. I think that that's certainly a possibility. Uh, although I would say that looking at it from a technological perspective, I think that uh, your point about uh, robots and, and technology uh, helping to eradicate some of the diseases that have been more prevalent uh, is probably a good, uh, a fair, fair point, and that may in fact actually downgrade some of the, uh, the, the commonness of it. Whereas the mental health issues, uh, I think, are a little bit harder to deal with, much more complex, and as our understanding of the brain is required, I think those those defy the uh, uh, the solutions that I think uh, uh, deal with more like things like cancer. Although there are robots involved with that as well too, as they have mm -hmm. like little yes. worm-like robots now that are working. Uh, on delivering uh, medicines internally mm -hmm. and things, so there's a, there's a convergence there, certainly. And we started with Da Vinci, and yes. we're going to close with Da Vinci because the name of the robotic surgeon is called Da Vinci. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. So <laughs> we've come full circle again. There we go. And uh, thank you so much for being on the show, Michael. I, I love this subject, um, and I hope it's brought a bit of a balance to to the discussion people have about the topic. And thank you for everyone for tuning in, and I'll see you next Thursday at 11 a.m. for We Like the One Percent. Aloha. Yay, well done.